Hi, I'm Dr. Evan Matthews. I'm here today to talk to you about um, exercising in cold environments. This is part three of a three-part series on exercising in hot and cold environments. Part one was just sort of an overview of how our bodies deal with hot and cold environments. Part two was specifically exercising in the heat. Now, again, this part three, the final part is going to be exercising in cold environments. So if you haven't already done so, um, please make sure that you watch the other two parts of this series. It'll make this last part make a lot more sense. So let's go ahead and start this. So when we exercise in the cold environments, our bodies are going to experience a uh, negative heat load. So essentially a cold stress or a cold load. And so this is going to be sensed by sensory neurons in the skin as well as in the core of the body. So so um, skin thermoreceptors and core thermoreceptors. And these sensory neurons are going to send a signal back to the brain, specifically to the hypothalamus in the brain, to tell it that the body is cold. Hypothalamus is then going to integrate these signals in, figuring out what's going on, understanding that it's now cold, and it's going to increase the sympathetic activity, specifically um, to cause an increase in shivering. So when we contract our muscles quickly, um, uh, like with shivering, it's gonna produce a lot of body heat. It's going to vasoconstrict the blood vessels in the skin, causing less blood to get to the skin so that we don't um, lose as much heat to the environment. And it's also going to increase metabolism. Our bodies are very inefficient, so anytime we increase the uh, amount of energy used, a lot of that energy is going to turn into heat, which is going to help to warm up the body. The way we are going to increase metabolism is by releasing thyroxine from the thyroid gland, which is going to increase metabolism. And we're also going to increase the sympathetic catecholamines, things like norepinephrine and epinephrine, um, which again are going to increase metabolism. And together, this is going to, again, help to raise body temperature. So if we, our bodies get really cold, um, it's going to lower our core temperature. And if our core temperature lowers, it's going to affect the SA node of the heart, which is going to lower heart rates. And all kinds of other things can also happen. Eventually, this can cause uh, arrhythmias, so cardiac arrhythmias, causing a potentially deadly situation. Another thing that um, happens is we're going to be breathing in this cold air. So a lot of people get concerned that um, if they breathe in cold air, it's going to damage their lungs. And if it's extremely cold, that might happen. But on a typical cold day, say um, zero degrees Celsius outside, which is around 32 degrees Fahrenheit, um, so right around freezing outside. If we're outside, we're exercising on a cold day like that. If you look at the air temperature as it enters the body, so by the time it gets to the pharynx, which is sort of the back of the mouth, it's already at 15 degrees Celsius. By the time it gets to the larynx, which is now into the, the top of the throat, um, it's now at 20 degrees Celsius. By the time it gets down into the bronchioles of the lungs, where it's going to actually uh, be getting to the alveoli where we have gas exchange, it's already going to be at 30 degrees Celsius. So our bodies are super efficient at warming up this temperature uh, of the air so that we're not freezing our lung tissue. Some other things that are going to happen when exercising in the cold though that are going to be negative things um, are going to be a decrease in muscle function. So the superficial muscle fibers, so the fibers that are closest to the skin, are actually going to become numb. All right? So they're going to get really cold and they become numb and so they stop working. The deeper muscle is going to stay okay. It's going to continue to contract. But if some of the muscle is numbed and not contracting, some of the muscle is contracting, obviously that's going to uh, cause a decreased uh, muscle performance and so a decreased exercise performance and so with this we're going to have altered fiber recruitment um, because we have to change which muscle fibers are being activated because the, the muscle fibers that we want to activate aren't going to respond because again they're numb and so all this is going to decrease contractile force it's going to decrease the uh, shortening velocity so how f the speed of the muscles and it's going to decrease the power of the muscles so as we fatigue and you know, as we exercise for long periods of time, we might see a, a decreased production in heat, which is a, a bad thing when we're exercising in a cold environment because that heat production is required in order to prevent us from experiencing some sort of cold injury. So the reason for this is as we deplete our energy stores um, through a sort of some sort of long endurance type exercise, we're going to um, 
basically run out of energy um, that's easily available that can produce lots of uh, heat and lots of energy quickly and so we're more likely to become hypothermic with long uh, endurance type exercise than what we would with shorter type of exercise in the cold. So the air temperature by itself is obviously a factor, but the air temperature doesn't tell us the whole story. We also need to know the wind chill. So the wind chill takes into consideration the temperature that's outside as well as the wind speed that's outside. And so as either one of these um, goes in this direction or this direction, so as it, the, uh, it becomes colder and colder or as the wind increases its speed, you're going to get progressively more into these more dangerous zones here um, where you're more likely to experience some sort of uh, cold injury uh, specifically something like frostbite um, and so the wind chill factor is a very useful indicator of the risk that you're going to face when going out into the the environment when it's cold outside so when going out into the, a cold environment, you definitely want to make sure that you can try to stay dry. Um, water is going to uh, pull heat away from the body about four times faster than air is going to. So if you're doing something like a polar bear plunge, you're going to feel that cold a lot more than if you were on the shore and just completely dry. Um, so that's the reason why something like a polar bear plunge is so sort of miserable and cold. If the water temperature is less than 30, 32 degrees Celsius, which is 89.6 degrees Fahrenheit, which is pretty warm water, once it gets below that though, that's when our bodies are no longer able to maintain our core temperature if you're in that water for a long time without some sort of protective gear, of course. Um, and so you need to make sure that you're using some sort of protective gear if you're in cold uh, water for a long period of time that's colder than this, which again, this is not that cold. Most swimming pools are are going to be cold from this. As an example, if you're in 15 degrees Celsius or 59 degrees Fahrenheit water, so something probably um, actually warmer than the water that you're seeing here, that's going to decrease our body temperature, our core temperature specifically, um, about 2.1 degrees Celsius or 3.8 degrees Fahrenheit every single hour. So that's going to drop our temperature down quite a bit uh, quickly. And uh, if we're experiencing moving water, that's going to drop the temperature down even more. So if the water is still our bodies are going to increase the temperature of the water right around our bodies and it kind of it's going to have sort of a protective layer of warm water if that water is continually moving and we get in a convective current um, that's going to uh, decrease the temperature of the water that our bodies are constantly experiencing and so we're going to have a lot more heat loss that way this is the reason why when you go into like an ice bath and you turn on the whirlpool function it feels a lot colder than if you just sit in the ice bath without the water moving. So a common misconception that I just want to make sure I address here is that the water does not have to be freezing, which would be zero Celsius or 32 Fahrenheit in order for us to experience hypothermia. Uh, it experiences that at much, much higher temperatures. And obviously the colder it is, the faster that will happen, but higher temperatures than, than zero Celsius, as high as 32 degrees Celsius can eventually lead to hyperthermia. So what is hypothermia? Hypothermia is when our body temperature is too low, causing some sort of problem, eventually potentially leading to something as severe as death. So if our core temperature um, gets down to 34.5 to 29.5 degrees Celsius, in this range, it's going to decrease the function of the anterior hypothalamus, um, which is going to be what controls our body's temperature. So it's going to cause our body to go into an extreme cold stress um, where things start to misfunction uh, to some degree. If the uh, core temperature goes below 29.5 degrees Celsius, the anterior hypothalamus is going to essentially stop functioning, and so we completely lose our ability to thermoregulate. And if we can't thermoregulate, Obviously, that's a serious condition, and our bodies are probably going to start to experience uh, organ failure and, again, potentially death. So first, you're probably going to experience slow metabolism, then maybe some drowsiness and lethargia, um, and then eventually coma and death can occur. Oftentimes, this is going to ca be caused by um, uh, some sort of cardiac arrhythmia, so the heart's going to uh, misfunction. So the general treatment for hypothermia, if it's a mild hypothermia, is just to remove Remove them from the cold environment, give them dry, warm clothing, give them blankets, give them warm beverages, and most of the time people are going to be just fine in a few hours or so. 
if it's a more severe hyperthermia, um, the person really should go to some sort of medical facility because um, not only are they at risk because they're so cold, but the warming process actually becomes potentially dangerous. So any sort of physical or emotional stress to somebody that is severely hypothermic is going to increase sympathetic activity, making cardiac arrhythmias more likely. You also need to gradually rewarm the person because if you warm them too quickly, that that's going to cause a physical strain in the body, again, increasing sympathetic activity, um, increasing the likelihood of a dangerous cardiac arrhythmia. And so in a hospital, they will slowly um, raise body temperature up in a safe way to make sure that they hopefully don't experience cardiac arrhythmia. And if they do, they're in, uh, hopefully in the right place to be able to have that addressed quickly so that maybe the person uh, will survive. But again, mild hypothermia can be addressed um, just by bringing them in a warm environment and helping them warm up. Severe hypothermia requires uh, medical personnel and a medical facility in order to do this uh, safely and appropriately. Now that's of course not saying if, if you are in an extreme example, uh, you know, you're, you're stuck somewhere where you can never, you know, you're not going to be able to get some medical attention. That's not to say not to help the person try to warm up. Obviously, if you let them continue to cool, they will eventually um, succumb to the hypothermia and potentially die. Um, but if you can get them to a medical facility, you're much better off. Some less serious uh, cold injuries, but also um, problematic, would be frostbite and uh, exercise-induced asthma. Let's start with the frostbite. So frostbite is literally your tissue freezing. So it's your the tissue inside your fingers freezing. That would be your finger being frostbitten. And so when this happens, you're having um, extreme vasoconstriction of the blood vessels going to that area. And if you're not getting blood to the area because of the vasoconstriction, that means you're not getting oxygen, you're not getting nutrients, and eventually the tissue can actually die. And so if this happens, if you have untreated frostbite and the tissue dies, that's what we call gangrene. And so gangrene is going to be um, when the tissue starts to die and potentially if it's long enough without being treated, it can rot. And so you're going to eventually lose tissue and you're going to have to have amputations. Generally speaking, the treatment for frostbite is going to be a gradual rewarming of the tissue. But it's important to make sure that you don't rewarm the tissue if you think it's going to freeze again. So let's say you're trapped in the middle of a blizzard on, you know, in some sort of mountain area, whatever, where you can't get to uh, a warm environment, uh, then rewarming their tissue just to allow it to refreeze before you can get into a warm environment is going to uh, damage this, those cells inside the, the frostbitten area twice. And so every time you do that, you're creating ice crystals inside the cells. Those ice crystals are sharp, and so it can puncture the cells and kill the cells, again, leading to tissue death and all these things I was just talking about. And so if you don't uh, know for sure that the person is going to be able to keep those uh, frostbitten appendages warm, usually, again, it's the fingers, it's the toes, it's the ears, the tip of the nose. So if you know that that's going, there's a high likelihood it's going to get refrozen, you're better off waiting to try to warm those up. Another thing, uh, let's say it's your hands, oftentimes people rub the hands together in order to produce heat. Um, if you're truly experiencing frostbite and you have ice crystals inside the cells of your hands, um, you don't want to rub those areas. You want to warm them without putting any real pressure, especially not rubbing type pressure where it's continually putting pressure on those cells. Because again, you have these sharp ice crystals inside the cells and it's going to puncture the cells, causing the cells to die. So you don't want to do that. Now I was talking about exercise induced asthma. Up to 50% of winter sport athletes, so um, skiers, uh, figure skaters, those types of people, they will develop exercise-induced asthma eventually. So they're going to need some sort of uh, treatment with a steroid-type inhaler that you associate typically with people with asthma in order to prevent them from having asthma attacks when they exercise in the cold. And the reason for this is they're drying out their airways all the time. And earlier I did say that our bodies do a good job of humidifying the air, and that's true. True, but if this is constantly happening, you're doing it every single day for years and years and years, eventually it's going to build up and your, your airways are going to um, start to respond to that and that's when you develop the exercise-induced asthma. So just like with uh, exercising in hot environments, you're better off preventing the heat injury 
Same thing in the cold, you're better off preventing the cold injury than trying to treat the cold injury. And so the ways we prevent cold injury is to dress in layers, and if you warm up uh, during the exercise, slowly remove layers to maintain a reasonably comfortable temperature. All right? You don't want to have too many layers on and sweat a lot because if you aren't able to stay dry, that's going to increase the likelihood of having some sort of cold illness once your body temperature starts to come back down. And so you also want to avoid prolonged exposure to the cold after exercise for that same reason because you're going to be covered in sweat and that sweat's going to chill your body and potentially increase the likelihood of having some sort of cold injury. So how do we prepare for um, coming cold weather? Okay, we can, uh, we can acclimate ourselves to cold the same way we can acclimate ourselves to heat. So you just have to experience little bits of cold weather um, over a period of time in order for your body to adjust. So once your body is acclimated to the cold, you're going to have a higher skin temperature before the onset of shivering. And that is good for sports uh, events because uh, typically shaking uncontrollably is not good for most athletic events. And so um, decreasing the need for shivering is going to be important for most athletes. And so the way we are going to decrease the need for shivering is by increasing the non-shivering non thermogenesis that happens. So basically increasing our our metabolism um, and this is also going to be besides beneficial to sports where accuracy of movement is important it's also going to increase the ability to sleep in the cold for people like say military personnel who have to be out in the cold environments for their job and so getting cold acclimated is also good for them because they're better able to tolerate the cold they're not shivering they're able to sleep better once you're cold acclimated, you're also going to have higher hand and foot temperatures, which is going to be because of a better um, peripheral blood flow. Our bodies aren't, ba they're basically our bodies aren't shutting off blood flow to the, the, the hands and the feet the way they normally would because they're, you're better able to maintain your body temperature. So it's not necessary to cut off blood supply to these peripheries. So the chances of having like frostbite are going to drop. All these adaptations I just mentioned are going to start to happen within about a week of exposure to the cold environment. So this is the end of the whole lecture series on hot and cold environments and exercise. Um, so again, part one was just an overview on how our bodies handle heat and cold. Part two was specifically exercising in hot environments. And part three that we just finished was exercising in cold environments. So if you have any questions or comments, you can put those in the comments section below. Otherwise, please come back and watch another video. Thanks.